Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. Just in case you're new around here, my name is Khaled and I'm a final year medical student. In this video, we're going to be talking about congenital heart pathologies. The majority of diseases are classified into different types of shunts, either right to left or left to right. When we talk about right to left shunts, we're talking about the right atrium or right ventricle shunting blood directly to the left side of the heart. The significance of this is that you are shunting deoxygenated blood that's coming from the superior and inferior vena cava directly into the left side of the heart, which is then immediately going into the systemic circulation. Therefore, your systemic circulation will have less oxygen and therefore less O2 content. Babies with this sort of right to left shunt would be termed as blue babies because their oxygen content in the blood drops. When we talk about left to right shunts, well, it's the exact opposite. Instead of shunting blood from the right side of the heart to the left side, you're shunting blood from the left atrium or left ventricle right into the right side of the heart. And although this doesn't cause any problems with oxygenation because you're just moving that already oxygenated blood back to get oxygenated even more, uh, the issues arise in the fact that you are just overloading the heart and lungs with more blood. And when you have more blood here that's going through the pulmonary circulation, your, your capillary hydrostatic pressure it goes up, and the way the vessels deal with that is they undergo remodeling. And that leads to pulmonary hypertension. So this is how these pathologies are pretty much classified. You have right to left shunts and you have left to right shunts. We're going to start this by talking mainly about the right to left shunts. So the first disease on the list is Tetralogy of Fallow, coined after Dr. Fallow, and it is a constellation of four findings, that's why it's called Tetralogy. The best way that I like explaining this is by giving it as a little story. Okay, so let's imagine we have the normal heart here, and recall that this ventricular septum right here, it was being formed by the muscular portion of both the left and right ventricle as well as the membranous portion. And this membranous portion was being formed by the septum between both the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So this septum here is forming that membranous portion. Now if the neural crest cells aren't migrating properly here, what ends up happening, if I can zoom this up a little bit, is imagine that this is the aorta and this is the pulmonary trunk, their septum is going to move slightly this way. So it doesn't meet the muscular portion of the, of the uh, ventricular septum. And because of this, the first thing that you can very clearly notice is that the aorta is actually taking a little bit of space from the pulmonary trunk, right? So if this was the pulmonary trunk, notice how it got much smaller. And the aorta is sort of overriding both the, the left ventricle as well as the right ventricle. So our first finding is this overriding aorta. And the second thing that's really apparent is since the septum uh, is sort of deviating this way, you have this sort of displacement of the infundibular septum, which is a small portion of the, of the uh, aortic pulmonary septum, uh, you're going to end up having a little defect here in the ventricular septum, and that's our VSD. Next up, since the, the overriding aorta is sort of borrowing space from the pulmonic trunk, you're going to have pulmonic stenosis. And this pulmonic stenosis is going to cause problems for the right ventricle. Since the right ventricle is connected more so with the, with the pulmonary trunk and is trying to push blood in there so it can get oxygenated, since it's stenotic, it's going to find a lot of difficulty with that, and because of it, it's going to undergo right ventricular hypertrophy. And the very classic buzz where they like to use is a boot-shaped heart on x-ray. And we'll see this soon. You, you actually see this on x-ray, and well, I'll show you an image soon. Uh, but it's really important to be able to recall what went wrong here. And if you remember that this aortic pulmonary septum was being formed by the neural crest cells, then it shouldn't surprise you that failure of migration of these neural crest cells is actually what causes tetralogy of fallow. And these patients, they would typically squat to improve their symptoms. And the reason it's really important to know this is because it ties in with basic physiology. So when you squat, you do mainly two things. You increase preload, but you also increase afterload. Now here, they're mainly concerned about the increase in afterload. When you increase afterload within the aorta, as we'll talk about in physiology, it should be aware to you that when you increase afterload in the aorta, afterload is sort of pushing against the aortic valve to, to prevent its opening from the left ventricle. In this case, since we have a defect in the ventricular septum, we're actually pushing a little bit of the deoxygenated blood through the aorta. So if there's anything we can do to actually prevent excess blood flow, like for example, increasing afterload, increasing that pressure that's preventing op opening of the aortic valve, then we're going to force more blood comparatively or relatively into the pulmonic trunk. And therefore, when they squat, Due to the increase in afterload in the aorta, you're going to actually force more blood into the pulmonic trunk. Therefore, more blood gets oxygenated and they feel a lot better. And one thing they really like you to know is that 
this tetralogy of foul is usually associated with 22q11 deletions. And could you think of an example of such a disease? If you thought of de George syndrome, that's usually the classical one they like to ask about. This is what a boot-shaped heart looks like. It's a very classical image. Usually the cardiac silhouette only goes about this far, but in this case, notice how it really goes out all the way up to here, and this sort of looks kind of like a boot, so you can get a boot-shaped heart. Next disease is the transposition of the great arteries. This is where instead of the aorta coming out of the left ventricle and the main pulmonary artery coming out of the uh, right ventricle, instead they've switched. And the reason they've switched is because recall that in embryology, the way that this aorta would end up with the left ventricle and this main pulmonary artery would end up with the right ventricle is that they actually end up spiraling. So failure of them to spiral, or rather failure to twist this, this uh, aortic pulmonary septum actually ends up with transposition of the great arteries. Now, unfortunately, this is incompatible with life. And the reason it's incompatible is because as soon as you get all that deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and it goes into the right atrium and gets pushed into the right ventricle, you are immediately pushing all of that deoxygenated blood back into the systemic circulation without any oxygenation whatsoever. So the only way that these babies would live is if there was, for example, a PDA or an ASD or even, for example, a VSD. If you have any of those shunts present, you would allow for some mixing of oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart, which is actually tied to the pulmonary circulation. So sometimes they like to trick you. Sometimes they'll, they'll mention that uh, an echocardiogram notices transposition of the great arteries, and then they also know that there was a PDA. And then they would put, for example, in the choices that, uh, what would you like to treat the patient with? And they would put indomethacin as a choice because they really want you to, to sort of close this PDA. But if you close this PDA, the patient is actually going to die. So what you're supposed to do is actually keep it open. And the way you keep it open is by giving them prostaglandin analogs. In this case, I have this example here of alprostadil. Sometimes I like to bring the x-ray or they give you the classic buzzword egg on a string appearance. This is how uh, that appearance is shown here. And uh, it's very, very classical of transposition of the great arteries. Next up is tricuspid atresia, and from the name itself, you have atresia of the tricuspid valve. In other words, you have absence of the tricuspid valve, and it's usually accompanied by a hypoplastic right ventricle. You usually need blood to fill up the right ventricle in order to actually uh, form it up and balloon it up, but since you're not actually forcing any blood into the right ventricle, it stays rudimentary. This condition is also not compatible with life and requires a shunt in order to uh, allow the baby for chances of survival. The next disorder is total anomalous pulmonary venous return, and uh, it's quite a mouthful, but the main problem with it is that instead of these pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium, they actually drain back into the right atrium. So you can picture pretty much this idea that as soon as you put any blood into the pulmonary circulation and then from the pulmonary circulation it has to return back to the left atrium, instead of returning to the left atrium, it just goes back into the right side of the heart and so on and so forth. So the main issue with this is that you're not sending any blood to the left ventricle, so your end diastolic volume is very low, and because of that, your cardiac output is very low. Therefore, you really need a shunt to sort of increase the amount of blood that reaches the left ventricle, and therefore would increase cardiac output. The next disorder is persistent truncus arteriosus. This is where you have one trunk that accompanies both the aorta and main pulmonary artery. This is where the aortic pulmonary septum completely fails to form and there is no septum separating both the aorta and main pulmonary artery. Most of these patients would have an accompanying VSD and this should make sense to you because the aortic pulmonary septum, as it's spiraling down, it's forming the membranous portion of the VSD. So if this fails to form, the membranous portion fails to form and therefore they usually have an accompanying VSD. And therefore, the blood from the right ventricle, which is deoxygenated, and the blood from the left ventricle, which is oxygenated, are therefore mixing both in the, in the common persistent trunk. Next up, we have Epstein anomaly. Now, normally what happens with the tricuspid valve is that as the, the uh, heart is growing, it's sort of growing in this direction. And the tricuspid valve, instead of being dragged along with it, it actually separates itself in order to stay at its location. Now, when it fails to separate at this point, if it remains attached, what can happen is it can actually grow downward along with the heart and therefore it gets displaced downward. You can notice that as soon as it gets displaced downwards and therefore is, is defined as Epstein anomaly, you can notice that the right ventricle is very, very small and therefore it's not really you know, working as well as it should. For that reason, you can get heart failure, you can get tricuspid regurgitation due to this displacement of the tricuspid valve. Another thing these patients could have are accessory conduction pathways. This is a very similar principle to uh, other accessory conduction pathways, such as, for example, Wolf Parkinson White, which we will cover more in the video about ECG. It's basically instead of trying to go the regular conduction pathway, the atria have a connection with the ventricles and therefore can depolarize them before 
uh, the AV node is able to actually send all of those depolarization waves over to the ventricles. One thing they really want you to know about Epstein anomaly is lithium exposure. So if you have, for example, a mother who uh, is taking lithium and, and she's pregnant, uh, this increases the chance of developing Epstein anomaly. It's heavily, heavily associated with it. And during the exam, they generally try to be a bit more sneaky than just mentioning lithium exposure. Instead, they like to say, a bipolar pregnant mother comes to your clinic, and then they would go on and, and say, and she's taking appropriate medication. So in your head, you have to know that when they say that she's bipolar and she's taking appropriate medication, she's likely taking lithium. Now let's discuss some left to right shunts as well as some other diseases like coarctation of aorta and Eisenmenger syndrome. Now we've talked a lot about VSDs and ASDs when uh, speaking about the embryology. What's mainly important to know is that they could be you know, asymptomatic and they usually are asymptomatic, but larger defects could lead to heart failure. This is because you keep sending more and more blood back into the right side of the heart. This is an echocardiogram. You can see that this is the left atrium. This is the right atrium in here. In this case, um, unless if there was something like Eisenmenger syndrome going on, you would be sending blood from the left side onto the right side. One thing they really like to ask in VSDs, they would give you a sort of table with the right atrium, right ventricle, and left atrium, sorry, this is right, and this is left ventricle, and they would say, for example, okay, so saturation here is like 70%, then it became like 80%, and here that we have 99, and here we have 99. So what they want you to know is that where did this extra 10% oxygen saturation come from? The right atrium and right ventricle are directly connected. So if, if, it, if it was 70% in the right atrium, it has to be 70% in the, in the right ventricle. So this jump is likely explained by a defect sending blood from the left ventricle into the right ventricle and therefore increasing oxygen saturation within the right ventricle. This is a very, very common style of, of asking about a VSD and they love for you to know that oxygen saturation increases in the uh, pulmonary trunk and right ventricle. As for the ASD, we talked a lot about paradoxical emboli in the embryology lecture. Feel free to go back to that lecture. Uh, I'll leave a link to it down in the description. Two more points that they really like you to know about is that it could cause a wide fixed split S2. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that in the Hearts, Downs, and Murmurs lecture, so stay tuned for that. And uh, if it's already released, you'll also find it in the description. And it's associated with Down syndrome. Next up, we have patent ductus arteriosus. And one thing they really like to know about, a very, very common buzzword, is that it is associated with a continuous machine-like murmur. Recall that this is a vessel needed for fetal circulation. We talked heavily about this in the uh, lecture about embryology. They like to ask questions about what would maintain patency of this, of this ductus arteriosus as well, what would close it. So recall that an increase in prostaglandins and low oxygen within the systemic circulation is actually going to uh, promote the, the opening or the, the maintaining patency of your ductus arteriosus, while the opposite, um, either prostaglandins decreasing uh, and or oxygen tension within the systemic circulation increasing, promote the closure of the ductus arteriosus. And sometimes you can develop something called late cyanosis, but I'd rather correlate this with coarctation of aorta. So we'll talk about this point and sort of correlate the ductus arteriosus with coarctation of aorta. So what is coarctation of aorta? Well, from its definition, it is juxtaductal aortic arch narrowing. So just near the ductus arteriosus, you're going to have narrowing of the aorta. And this can be reflected here in several locations. So you can have something called preductal coarctation of aorta, where the, the narrowing happens just before the ductus arteriosus. You can have uh, postductal coarctation of aorta, where this sort of narrowing happens just after. Recall the blood's going this way and going into the descending aorta. So you can have a narrowing just after the, the ductus arteriosus, and that would be called postductal uh, coarctation of aorta. Usually how these patients present, since you have this sort of coarctation, you're preventing that much flow from going into the descending aorta, you have a lot of blood in this region. And because of that, that blood, it's going to sort of push against the walls of the aorta, and that's called pressure. Since you have more blood here, you therefore have more force pressed on the walls, and therefore you have even higher pressure. However, down here, since you have less blood, you'll have lower pressure. And since this descending aorta is going to feed the, the lower limbs, you should expect high blood pressure in the upper extremities and low blood pressure in the lower extremities. Another thing that these patients have is a brachiofemoral delay. This is where the brachial pulse would not be at the same instance as a femoral pulse. You'd actually feel the brachial pulse first, and then, for example, half a second after or a second after, you would feel the femoral pulse. And this is just a testament to the fact of how 
how much flow you are you are limiting going down into the descending aorta and into the iliacs and then reaching the femorals. Now, generally speaking, a preductal coarctation of aorta is going to be much more severe than a postductal coarctation of aorta. Now, let's talk about this differential cyanosis, or otherwise known as late cyanosis. The entire idea of late cyanosis is that if we have a preductal coarctation of aorta, note that although the blood is going down into the descending aorta from the from the aortic arch, the majority of blood is actually going through the ductus arteriosus. So if they were to have this ductus arteriosus, for example, until they're 10 years of age, and then suddenly it closes, you lost a big portion of the amount of flow going to the lower limbs. So they would live all their life, they would not have any cyanosis in their lower limbs, and so on and so forth, and then all of a sudden, they would develop cyanosis in, the, in their lower limbs. That is what is termed as differential cyanosis and what's termed as late cyanosis. Both mean the same thing. Let's talk a little bit more about coarctation of aorta. So why would why can it cause heart failure? For example, if you have a lot of pressure here, recall that this is kind of a measure of afterload. This is this pressure, for example, if it was 180 millimeters of, for example, over 120, then this is the pressure that the the left ventricle has to sort of surpass in order to open this aortic valve because this pressure, recall, it's pushing an against all the walls and also pushing against the aortic valve. So the only way to open this aortic valve is to generate a higher pressure than it. So the left ventricle has to contract extremely hard in order to surpass this pressure. And sometimes when it's a little too much for it to handle, it can undergo heart failure. It's also generally uh, associated with an increased risk of very aneurysms and these could lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. And also you can have aortic rupture due to the insane amount of pressure within the aortic arch. Another common complication is infective endocarditis, and this is just by virtue of uh, uh, obstructing proper laminar flow. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about notch ribs and this figure 3 on chest x-ray. As you can see here, you sort of have these, these little divots at the bottom of the ribs. They're not extremely prominent, but I'm trying to draw over them to sort of show you these little divots and the reason these happen well I'm sure you went once to the anatomy lab and they showed you for example let's say the the clavicle and then you noticed a groove on the clavicle and they told you hey that's the subclavian groove because that's where the subclavian artery is well look when we make this bone what's actually happening is as the artery sort of glides right on top of it and sort of rests on it as this artery expands and pushes on itself onto the bone if you were to ever lift that artery off, you would see an impression onto the bone. And that's exactly what's happening here. You have under the rib this neurovascular bundle. And then as you increase the pressure within the aorta, you're going to have all of that pressure go into the intercostal arteries. And because of that, since you're facing much more pressure than usual, they are slamming themselves onto the, the bones, the ribs, much harder. And because of that, you get notching. Now, you probably learned this um, at some point in your, uh, in your uh, medical school journey. If you were to ever, for example, take a tap from the chest, you always go over the rib, not under the rib. And that's just a testament to the fact that we don't have a neurovascular bundle on top of the rib. This is why you don't see any notching on top of the rib you only see notching under the rib because that's where the neurovascular bundle is. And in this case, the vascular bundle, the artery here, the intercostal arteries, they are facing a tremendous amount of pressure more so than usual. So they're pushing that pressure against the bone and therefore you see rib notching. You can also see the sort of figure three sign and that is exactly the, the this pretty much is the aortic knuckle and it's supposed to go very smoothly like that. But when it goes inwards and outwards, that gives us an idea that, hey, there could be narrowing right there at the aortic isthmus. Last but not least, we're going to talk about Eisenmenger syndrome and the best way to actually talk about it is to recall what I was saying earlier. So remember when we were talking about left to right shunts and I was saying that as you keep overloading the heart and pulmonary circulation, you could have increase in capillary hydrostatic pressure and because that you could face some some pulmonary vascular remodeling as, as I wrote here well that would, could eventually lead to pulmonary hypertension and if you generate enough pressure within the pulmonary trunk that pressure will get transmitted back into the right ventricle so at some point the right ventricle might have so much pressure that it actually is relatively higher than the left ventricle so eventually this left to right shunt might turn into a right to left shunt and as soon as it does, as, as soon as blood preferentially gets shunted the opposite way, you would have a right to left shunt. 
the onset is variable. There's nothing that could determine what, when someone would have Eisenmenger syndrome. And something really important here is that it causes late cyanosis. This is very similar to the one that we talked about with preductal coarctation of aorta uh, with the PDA. And, and the reason it's very similar is because they present in very similar ways. When we were talking about preductal coarctation of aorta and, and how they with the PDA they would not have any cyanosis in their lower limbs, and then when they present, you know, later on as the PDA closes with cyanosis they would have a very similar presentation to these patients who have a left to right shunt, not causing any cyanosis, but then as soon as it turns into a right to left shunt, they would then present with cyanosis. They could also present with clubbing and polycythemia. And with that, I really hope you enjoyed this video and you found it beneficial. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing as it motivates me to make all these beneficial videos for all of you. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.